of the School of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures. So we have many reasons to know each other. Welcome to people who come to campus from outside. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome Dr. Pedro Ampar to be here today to speak about um, popular cinema in Iran. Uh, because uh, most of the people who do research on Iranian cinema leave this very important aspect of Iranian cinema out. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, uh, Professor Partavi describes himself as a his historian of medieval and modern Muslim worlds. So you can see how many of us have to really stretch ourselves to be able to cover many, many areas. And, and um, he is um, um, training and education certainly qualifies him to look at cinema and many other aspects of the culture. Um, one of his passions in his work is to look at the concept which he defines as civil religion. In other words, how has the um, sympathies and the religious belief system um, been shaped and reshaped within the nation state that is present day Iran. And he's looking at cinema in order to um, look at understanding this and basically avoid having a binary that divides, for example, the country into radical Muslims and you know radical seculars. That, so he's, he's trying to really get rid of these kinds of harmful um, binaries. He's, um, he did his undergraduate in Binghamton University and then came to Washington University in St. Louis to do his master's degree, and that is the, when we met for the first time. As a very bright MA student who was taking Persian and many other things, and then later on, Dr. P P Patovi went to uh, Chicago, University of Chicago, to do his um, PhD, has taught um, in many, many different parts of the world, uh, of, of the country, I'm sorry, has traveled actually to Iran frequently, and currently he teaches in American University. So please welcome, and, and he has published in, in many um, journals in the field, including International Journal of Middle East Studies, Iranian Studies, Comparative Studies of South Asia and the Middle East. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to hear from him about popular Iranian cinema. Please welcome Professor Pedro Ampatu. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Keshavaris, uh, for having me today. Uh, and thank you to the Roshan Institute for Persian Studies for having me today. It's a great honor. Could you move the mic up? Yes. It's a, it's a great honor to, to be here. Um, as uh, Dr. Keshavaris um, uh, you know, I want to talk about popular cinema in Iran today. Uh, some of you may already know something about the Iranian cinema. There's an enormous and ever-expanding body of literature on the Iranian on Iranian films. Uh, you may have also seen some of these films as well. But the Iranian films that we have largely seen, heard about, and read about uh, here in the United States are not necessarily the films that people in Iran watch or have watched historically. Uh, and the history of Iranian cinema generally um, in English, uh, in the Anglophone literature that we have, has been presented to us in a very selective manner with lots of gaps. And uh, from some accounts, we might even conclude that Iranian cinema is only a few decades old. It really only goes back to the establishment of the Islamic Republic or even later, to after the Iran-Iraq War. Uh, and we can learn about uh, what we can learn about cinema before the Islamic Revolution in these histories that we have is often limited to a handful of pioneering films and filmmakers in the late 1960s or the 1970s that sort of paved the way for this globally recognized and increasingly globally oriented uh, post revolutionary Iranian art cinema. Um, and my current research is concerned with what's been largely left out of or dismissed in these particular film histories, this popular commercial cinema uh, 
uh, in Iran. And I'm especially concerned with the heyday of popular Iranian cinema during the late Pahlavi era, so the 1960s and the 1970s. We're not talking about a small number of films here. Uh, we can say that between uh, the decade of the 1950s until the end of the 1970s, roughly a thousand films were released by these commercial studios. So uh, these are films that we virtually know nothing about. Uh, if we've read anything about Iran, if we've only read uh, about Iranian cinema in the English language. Uh, well my, my interest in the popular cinema partly stems from this absence, from its suppression in the scholarly literature on Iranian cinema. And the major question that I'm asking is why have critics and academics been so dismissive historically of films intended for the mass audience uh, in Iran? And what I aim to do today, I mean, obviously I can't tell you everything, this is an introduction. What I aim to do today is to give you a brief introduction to the Iranian popular cinema with special attention paid to those decades of the 1960s and 1970s when it enjoyed its greatest successes. And I want to talk about the aspects of entertainment uh, in these films and their potential historical roots. And I also want to talk about critiques of the popular cinema and its conventions and how those critiques have contributed to the relative absence of these films from scholarly accounts of the Iranian cinema. Well, uh, cinema in Iran really gets its start as a novelty for the elites. The first films that were produced and screened uh, were produced and screened in the Qajar royal court um, <clears throat> of Mozart al-Din Shah. And again, this gives you an idea of how they were getting to the point of filmmaking itself. This is sort of proto-cinematic experiment, where you see the before and the after. Okay, and this is all taking place at around the end of the 19th century, so around the same time that cinema is taking off everywhere around the world. Photography and cinema taking off everywhere around the world. Here's the staging of a theatrical spectacle on film in the court itself. So this guy's guts have spilled out, and they're trying to pack it back in again, I guess. <laughs> Here are some of Muzak Fadadin Shah's eunuch actors. The guy in the center is Esau Khan. He was one of the favorites of the, uh, of the court. And here's some rare footage that we have of these early films that were produced in the court of Muzak Fadadin Shah. Okay. And so <clears throat> early on, it's just a novelty for elites, whether we're talking about the court or uh, elites in society at large. So early public screenings of foreign shorts were located in the back rooms of shops in Tehran and a few other cities and played mainly to foreign residents and members of the educated classes. And until the mid-1930s, really, movie-going continues to be a predominantly elite leisure activity. It's not something that people do on a regular basis, the common people do on a regular basis. Um, and much has been made of the religious objections to the cinema as obstacles to its growth and popularity over these first few decades. But other factors, uh, such as lack of access to the cinema and lack of interest in the films being screened, play equal roles in tamping down attendance. And I think there's, there's something to be said about that. I mean, at this point in time, really until the 1930s, it's, we're talking mainly silent films. And I think this ties into what I believe people in Iran have thought about entertainment generally. Entertainment and film entertainment particularly is, doesn't just have a visual aspect, it has an audiovisual aspect. And so sound is very important to the growth of cinema and the growth, growth and popularity of cinema uh, in Iran. Um, well, for the incipient masses in this period before cinema takes off, popular entertainment continued to revolve around homegrown theatrical and storytelling traditions, often performed on makeshift stages. And these performances took inspiration from both folk and courtly literary sources, whose heroes often came in surprising packages. The heroic image in Iran and the wider Persianate world 
has long been connected up with figures whose greatest virtue has been their exclusion from and opposition to the social order and its moral hypocrisy. And of course, those who brought to life such characters were themselves marked as social outcasts because of their lowly status as performers and entertainers. And the real and perceived connections of the entertainer classes with criminal types at this point in time only heightened their marginality uh, in society. So we have an interesting phenomenon here where social marginalization is itself a component of heroism, but it's also characteristic of those charged with representing it on stage. Uh, and these representations of heroism would later prove important to the development of popular Iranian cinema and its modes of entertainment. Uh, but the domestic film industry was not yet a reality in the 1930s. And surprisingly, it is an Indian production of the first Persian language sound film that gave cinema and cinema going uh, in Iran a boost. And again, as I said before, I mean, sound is crucial. Before sound, there really isn't a mass audience. With sound, we get a mass audience, which again, I think from my perspective, sort of clues you in on what audiences have found important about film. Visual aspects clearly matter, but without music, clever dialogue, then it's not really a film as far as people are concerned. So we have in the early 1930s the production uh, in India of a Persian language film known as Dokhtar Lor, or The Lore Girl. Uh, and it opened in Iran in 1933 to vast audiences. It topped theater marquees in Tehran for over seven months. So lots of people went to see this movie. Um, and it's hard to underestimate the impact of this particular film. Uh, many viewers went, even went so far as to adopt the, uh, in their daily speech the Kermani accent of this <laughs> fil uh, the film's female protagonist, Gornar, uh, who was played by Lou Hangi's Somi Nejot, who was just a secretary in one of these uh, Bombay uh, film studios. The film was written and directed by a young Iranian who had traveled to India in the 1920s to study pre-Islamic Iran with some Parsi scholars in Bombay. There's a large Zoroastrian, historically a large Zoroastrian community in Bombay uh, known as the Parsis. And uh, this young Iranian by the name of Abdul Hussein, this is a poster of, of the film itself, it was released. I not included. Okay, sorry. I'll jump back. Yeah, but there was a young Iranian uh, scholar who had gone to India, known as Abdul Hussein Sapanta, um, to study pre-Islamic Iran, and he'd gotten involved with, uh, introduced to those in the Parsi community who were involved in the early Hindi language uh, films being produced in Bombay. And this provided Sapanta opportunities to present his idea for the first Persian language sound film with the resulting product is, as I pointed out, playing an outsized role uh, in the shape that domestic Iranian cinema would take in future decades. And <clears throat> Mohsen Mahmalbov, in his pseudo-historical Once Upon a Time Cinema, which is a sort of history of the Iranian cinema, uh, very nicely points to the dual origins of the Iranian cinema, both in the Bajar court. So we have the Bajar Shah sort of falling in love with this golden art character who jumps out of the film uh, to take a real form um, in this particular film. So very nicely points to these sort of dual origins of the Iranian cinema, both in the Bajar court and in this Indo-Iranian film, uh, The Lord Girl presenting this imaginary love affair between the Qajar Shah and Golnar. Um, <clears throat> well, Sepanto's efforts didn't immediately encourage a wider cinema-going boom or the establishment of film studios in Iran. Accessibility still remained an issue at this point in time. And the introduction of uh, dubbing in the post-World War II period would help to change this particular situation. And like with early film production, the early dubbing of films into Persian uh, largely took place outside of Iran, in India, I'm sorry, not in India, but in Italy and in Turkey. 
uh, and given the costs and risks associated with film production, then dubbing becomes a sort of relatively cheap and lucrative entry into the world of cinema. And some of these dubbers fully embrace the opportunity. They carefully chose their films, understanding that the dubber film was in some sense to remake it, uh, and that their choices would help to determine its success or failure. Um, and this might involve changing names in the film itself, changing the names of characters, sometimes the relationships between the characters, changing the dialogue, and even editing and reordering scenes to better suit uh, the narrative to Iranian sensibilities. Uh, and so uh, this effort didn't just involve a change in language, but frequently a change in content. Uh, that sort of wholly Iranianized these films. So we have these foreign films that are being dubbed, but then being made into Iranian films. Um, and <clears throat> it was especially Italian uh, adventure films uh, with Hercules or Machiste as the main characters that were dubbed into Persian at this point in time. Many Egyptian films were also being dubbed into Persian at this point in time. Uh, and with the Egyptian films, there was less need for re-editing and reordering of scenes or remaking uh, the characters so that it would fit Iranian sensibilities. And the same thing can be said about Indian films, too, at this point in time. They're being dubbed into Persian as well and shown to mass audiences. And dubbing efforts could also extend to film songs, too. So <clears throat> this is perhaps the most famous uh, dubbed film of the pre-revolutionary period, Sound of Music, which in Persian was known as Ashka by Labkhan Ha, or uh, Tears and, and Laughter, or Tears and Smiles, I should say. Okay. Uh, not only was the dialogue redone in this film, but all of the songs were redone with Persian lyrics uh, for this particular film, too. Um, and it was, in fact, released as a soundtrack. Um, well, once dubbing studios were established in Iran, many of the voiceover artists hired uh, were theater actors who were brought over from the radio, which was beginning to reach mass audiences at around the same time in the 1940s and the 1950s. Um, and the skill of the voiceovers is perhaps best illustrated in the subsequent practice of dubbing even in locally produced feature films. So even films that were being produced in Iran the audio was always done after the fact. So they, would, uh, they would film the film, and then in post-production they would add audio. And sometimes they wouldn't even use the, the actors' voices. Uh, they would use these voiceover artists instead of the actors, even though the actors obviously clearly knew Persian and were speaking Persian in the films. Um, so this was not uncommon to have dubbing artists replace the voices of some Iranian actors after the filming uh, was complete. Um, as, I, as I point out, I, I, <clears throat> radio is very important to uh, the growth of dubbing in Iran and the growth of the film industry in Iran itself, and, and musical stars too. So this was one of the biggest, Dal Cash was one of the biggest female uh, musical stars of the 1950s. She also made the transition to uh, film at this point in time. In fact, I would argue that it's very, very difficult to disentangle the music industry from the film industry during this period of time. They're sort of wound up together uh, in many ways. And if you became a pop star, then it was more than likely that you would also become a film star. Um, and in this respect, again, I don't think it's altogether that different from the situation in India either, where, it, again, it's very, very difficult to disentangle the music industry from the film industry. Um, well, and here's a poster of one of the films in which she starred in the 1950s called Fardo Roshanast, or Tomorrow is uh, Another Day, I guess is the best way of translating it. Okay. So, <clears throat> voiceovers could also help to launch careers um, in front of the camera, and one of the biggest stars of the uh, of the 1960s and 1970s was Behruz Vusuri, who started out as a dubbing artist, as a voiceover actor, uh, uh, dubbing over voices for films, and then transitioned uh, to uh, 
standing in front of the camera uh, at this point in time. Um, and again, the, the fact that many of the commercial film studios that were established after the Second World War, the fact that they began as dubbing studios undoubtedly contributed to this logic behind post-production sound recording. And this is something that goes on uh, to the present day. Many films today that, is, that are being produced in Iran, uh, the sound is still recorded after the fact. Um, and the term, film Farsi, or film Farsi, Persian film, uh, which would become the most common epithet used in reference to the popular commercial cinema in Iran after the Second World War, really begins its life as a descriptive term. It's used in advertisements of dubbed foreign films, so that people will know that this is a film that's being shown in the Persian language. And in the 1950s, this term was taken up by critics of the locally produced cinema to indicate what they believe to be its lack of cultural authenticity we can kind of see the connections that people are making between these two things. Uh, critics, industry people, and even fans have ever since used this particular term, film Farsi, uh, in reference to the popular commercial cinema, uh, with a variety of meanings, but generally negative ones uh, attached to it. And Dr. Hu Sheng called Hu Si, uh, who has often been credited with first popularizing the term film Farsi, was asked in an interview a few years ago to define it. And I know that some of you are studying Persian here, so I thought I'd include some Persian text for you to look at uh, as well. This is the quote that he gives to define this term, at least from his perspective, uh, as the one that sort of popularizes this, this particular epithet for the popular uh, commercial cinema. And he says, film Farsi, han film boot, which means that while film may be, this is a sort of rough translation, while film, uh, Farsi may be of film, and in the Persian language, in his opinion, it is neither cinema nor part of the Persian literary artistic tradition. Well, this is, it's these kinds of definitions of the popular cinema that I take exception to. Uh, this idea of film Farsi or Persian film as culturally inauthentic. A uh, major aim in my own research is to demonstrate that film Farsi is one of the few modern art forms that we have uh, that is drawing on the cultural past to make sense of the present. Uh, and film Farsi has been a product, certainly, of a whole host of influences, not only historical ones, native ones, but also foreign ones. Um, but it's not derivative or entirely de derivative in the ways that people like Dr. Kavusi described it to be. Dr. Kavusi's claims have always been that film Farsi is entirely derivative of Hollywood. It's a second-rate copy of that most of these films are second-rate copies of Hollywood films. But I think any close viewing of these film Farsi productions will show that the notions of entertainment that organize film Farsi don't quite match up with what we think of as entertainment in the Hollywood film. And it's film Farsi and its entertainments that are the primary, primary fuel behind the rapid expansion of film production and film going in Iran in the post-war era, after World War II. Uh, so we have an explosion of theater construction throughout the 1950s and 1960s with more than 400 cinema halls uh, in existence throughout the country by the early 1970s. We also have a steadily rising number of films being produced annually until we hit uh, 90 films a year uh, in, in the early 1970s. And <clears throat> the, there were so many uh, films being produced and such a shortage of prints of films. There was actually a film made about this. Uh, that day and eight, this is a film called Reza Motori, or the, the uh, Reza the Cyclist, the Motorcyclist. Um, at that point in time, most films came on three to five reels. Uh, and what would happen is that you would have sometimes multiple theaters sharing one set of prints for a particular film. So they would show the first reel, and then it would be packed up and given to one of these motorcycle couriers to take it to the next theater where it would be delivered there, and then uh, a sort of loop would be created uh, in order to show the film without any stoppages. 
uh, and still be able to use one print to show the same film in two or three theaters at once. Um, and so, <clears throat> as I say, the film industry is growing so quickly at this point in time that it's hard for the infrastructure to keep up with it. And, <clears throat> and it's Film for C really that's the catalyst for much of this. Film for C, I think, from my, at least from my perspective, is giving the growing home, home audience something that they can't quite get elsewhere. It's not just badly remade Hollywood films with hairier actors. Uh, this, is not, <laughs> this is not what's happening here. Uh, first of all, it's difficult to speak of genres in Film for C. Uh, obviously, in Hollywood, too, genre classification can be problematic. Uh, but with Film for C, the operative genres in Hollywood don't really apply. Uh, it's perhaps easier to categorize Film for C titles by their place in time, uh, in the same way that critics and academics have talked about Indian cinema or Japanese cinema. Um, Film for C has mythologicals, stories that are outside of history, including episodes from the Shah Nameh or the Book of Kings. It has historicals, drawing on the post-Islamic uh, history of Iran and the wider Persianate world. And it has socials, uh, which are by far the largest category of films, and which usually focus on urban family life uh, in contemporary Iran and its problems. I, mean, I think if we were to do a breakdown of all of the film Farsi titles, we would find that something close to 95% of the films are what I'm calling here socials. Um, and all three of these film categories have dramatic elements, usually rooted in some kind of class or generational conflict, uh, afflicting a family, either a biological family or a surrogate family. Uh, and a resolution is usually achieved through the hero's sacrifice of his personal happiness or even personal well-being uh, for the sake of that family. And while the dominant forms of social organization are not... Uh, may be threatened in some of these films, they're generally not overturned. Uh, and in fact, the social marginality of many film Farsi heroes serves to further highlight their commitment to the institutions of society in which they seemingly have no stake. So we have lots of people living on the margins of society and of law in these particular films, but in a sense, their job is through their self-sacrifice to uh, underline, highlight the importance of these particular social institutions, that they are being left out of, that they're being uh, excluded from because of what they get up to on a daily basis, because of their class background and so on. Um, so yes, I mean, certainly there are dramatic elements in all of these films that center on the family, uh, that uh, revolve around family conflict. There are also comic elements and interludes in virtually every one of these films. So it's hard to say that, that you know, like we might think of a serious drama in Hollywood. There's no such thing in film films. Almost every film has a comic character or some kind of comic element to it. And these comic elements are not just there to lighten the mood or, uh, in a sense, to, to add a little bit of excitement after uh, something that's a bit of a bummer, a scene that's a bit of a bummer. Um, they often involve some kind of critique, aspe critiquing aspects of the status quo. And certainly I would, I would argue that this is part of their entertainment as well, the sort of social critique that these comic elements provide. Um, and all three of these film categories that I've been talking about, the historical, the mythological, and the social, may also have songs. Song, as is often the medium for communicating the deepest and most intense feelings of the characters in the films. Um, and the two moods that dominate in film Farsi songs are qam, or despair and grief, and masti, or exhilaration and intoxication. Of course, these are the two themes that also dominate poetry, Persian poetry as well. If anybody knows anything about it, performance of Persian poetry, well, more often than not, it's supposed to be sung. Uh, so we can see how uh, at least elements of this film for C cinema is linked up to older cultural modes uh, and performances as well. Um, so yes, I wanted to show you some examples of this, of Masti and Qam in Iranian 
uh, in popular Iranian cinema. This is a disc that I bought many years ago um, of a collection of film songs from these popular films of the 1960s and 1970s. The actress here we see is Puri Banai, one of the bigger stars of the 60s and 1970s. And I'll leave it up to you, even if you don't understand the language, I think it's it, you can pretty much figure out what the dominant mode of this the dominant mood of this particular song is. <laughs>
one, one of the points that I'm trying to make here is that these films, Film Farsi, is, has a sort of aestheticist dimension to it that we really don't get with films after the revolution. I wish I had time to talk about some of the post-revolutionary cinema. Maybe I can come back another time and talk about that. Uh, but there's a sort of aestheticist dimension to these films. It's about enjoying life, in a sense, that we don't quite get with many of the films that are being made after the revolution itself. Um, where you know all pleasure and joy is deferred in time and space, by and large. Uh, that's for the next world, at some level. Um, and so yes, again, I mean, as I say, and it, it becomes clear in some of these scenes too that you know uh, it's very hard to disentangle the audio elements from the visual elements. They go together, and as I said, it's very hard to disentangle film and music altogether uh, in Iran. Um, and again, certainly for those who have watched popular Indian films, there would seem to be far more connections between film Farsi uh, and Bollywood uh, than uh, between film Farsi and Hollywood. And I think it's for good reason, as we've seen and we've sort of discussed before. I mean, the very beginnings of the popular Indian cinema uh, are congruent with the beginnings of the popular Iranian cinema. They grow up in the same place. They're, uh, the people that are responsible for them are the same people in many ways. It's this Parsi community in India that's both responsible for the earliest uh, Bollywood films, and they're also responsible for the first Iranian, popular Iranian films too. There's a long-standing connection between these two cinemas historically, uh, and in terms of conventions, uh, and narrative modes, they're very similar to one another, but there are also long-standing historical reasons why they are similar to one another, too. Uh, it's not just because they started in the same place, it's because they're drawing on the same kinds of cultural tropes that have a much deeper history in Iran and India than just the 20th century. Um, and again, I mean, the biggest hit, one of the biggest hits of the pre-revolutionary period in Iran, one of the biggest film Farsi hits, was a film called Ganja Harun. Some of you may have seen, I don't know if you have or not. Anybody want to raise their hand as if they've seen Ganja Harun? Okay. Well, this is a film, uh, <clears throat> again, like many uh, film Farsi films of the time, it's about uh, a man who abandons his family uh, in search of, in the pursuit of personal, uh, the accumulation of personal wealth, and his son uh, and wife grow up on their own, uh, or uh, his son grows up on his own uh, uh, under his mother's care, um, and as this now incredibly rich man uh, comes towards the end of his life, he begins to regret what he's done, and decides to commit suicide, and so he goes to Esfahan, uh, where he came from, where he had abandoned his family to throw himself off uh, a, a bridge into the Zoyandaru River and drown. You can't do that anymore today. It's all dried up. But back then you could do this. Um, <clears throat> and he goes <clears throat> to drown and of course fate steps uh, into the breach and his son happens to be his long lost son happens to be walking by at the same time that he decides to throw himself into the river, saves him. And again, this is a very important thing too. Fate, destiny, pesmat, tahvir play a very important part in these films. They're the sort of unheard of character, unseen character in these films too. Uh, but they're always there. It's always there working in the background, putting the hero in a position to act uh, for the sake of the family, for, uh, to resolve the social antagonism at the center of the film. Um, and so <clears throat> he saves uh, his father, but he doesn't quite know that it's his father at this point. He, he doesn't find out until the very end of the film. Um, but he gets caught up in a, in a uh, the, the son, uh, the hero of the film, gets caught up in a whole bunch of uh, plots uh, in order to save this strange woman that's entered into his life uh, that's also at some remove connected with his father too. Uh, and so he pretends to be the long lost son of uh, this incredibly rich man, Harun, uh, uh, who's returned from India uh, and has come to marry this 
this this strange girl that sent this uh, that sent it into his life to save her from uh, uh, another marriage, another court uh, person that's courting her. And so, I want to show you a couple of scenes from this film that sort of make the point of this connection between the Indian cinema and the Iranian cinema. Let's see if we can find this thing. I apologize for this. So the first clip that I want to show you, oh, okay, I have to open this. The first clip that I want to show you is a, is a song and dance sequence where the, this, this girl that's entered into to our hero's life um, is expressing her true and deeply felt emotions for him through song. As I said, I mean, song is crucial to the uh, communication of the deepest and most intense emotions in these particular films. And voyeurism is a big part of the entertainment of these particular films. Too. These aren't emotions that we, uh, that Iranians generally uh, communicate to uh, non-intimates. And so the ability to see them on screen itself is part of the entertainment as far as I'm concerned. Okay. So yes, I mean by this point she's been completely charmed by his ma uh, masculine virtue, his, his willingness to sacrifice himself, uh, to, to lie and dissimulate in order to save her from this bad marriage. What was she wearing? She's singing in a sort of Bollywood film style. film out there where there isn't some, it, it's almost an obligation, there has to be a shirtless scene of that, <laughs> at least once uh, in one of these films. Well, because also, again, the, as I say, all of these entertainments traditionally, historically, have been connected with one another. And by entertainments, I don't just mean storytelling, theater, 
but also sports like wrestling. Okay, I mean, uh, it, this was this was part of both popular and courtly entertainment for centuries. Really, going back, I mean, wrestling as a courtly entertainment goes back to the Timurid era. So this is a this is a big part of what we might think of as entertainment in this part of the world. And Faradin, interestingly enough, came to the cinema from wrestling. And in fact, many of the major stars of the cinema at this point in time came from some kind of athletic background, if not from wrestling itself. And of course, the wrestlers were also connected up with the rough and tumble types of the poorest parts of town. It was hard, in a sense, to disentangle wrestling from criminality, from the bazaar, from entertainments altogether. All these things are, in a sense, linked with one another. Okay. So, well, we, I think we've seen enough of this particular clip. <laughs> we'll, move on to the, we'll move on to the next one. <laughs> we'll move on to the next one. And this is, this is uh, the penultimate scene in the film itself where uh, Fahadin, the, the, the hero of the film, introduces himself to high society in Tehran as the long lost son of, um, uh, of Harun, of, of the, the rich man that's abandoned his family uh, uh, in this particular scene. And he pretends like he's come back from India. And this is what this song is called, this man as Hendal Mada. I've just come from <laughs> So you see 
he's, he's telling them, you know, you, you guys all sit around uh, worried about your money. You're not concerned with the rest 